He's a man, such a man, such a man, he's a real, a real man's man, he's a man, such a man. Welcome back to Ultra Spectacus, a journey through classic Ultraman. Well, in case you didn't hear, a new Ultra 7 short was announced. Of course, it would happen right at the time I was doing post-production on part one, so I decided to bring it up here. Basically, it'll be a what-if story to celebrate the 55th anniversary of the series, so look forward to that sometime this fall. Maybe I'll do a video on that separately. We'll see. Anyway, back to our favorite alien killer. Previously, we've seen Ultra 7 slice, dice, and never ask questions later. 7 could give lessons to Jason Voorhees in the mutilation department. So let's see who he chops up next, shall we? In episode 11, Fly to Demon Mountain, lightning crashes and a dragon falls to Earth. I almost thought this was an opening to a certain Super Sentai series for a second. The next day, a gang of teenagers are out for a drive and to take pictures, unaware that something has them in their crosshairs. <laughs> And they're dead. Several more accidents involving teenagers crop up, and Ultra Guard is brought in to check it out. 28 teenagers, to be exact. Damn, Freddy and Jason combined couldn't kill that many teens in one movie. The team heads to Mount Iwami, aka the Demon Mountain. Soga is afraid to go because it's Friday the 13th and something bad might happen. Wait a minute. Dead teenagers, Friday the 13th? Are we sure Sean S. Cunningham isn't an Ultraman fan? When they check the terrain, the sniper hits Dan. Aw, oh, dang it, there goes the hero of the show. Well, this is awkward. Dan has announced DOA and Soga breaks down, feeling guilty for his death. The crew gets a call about a cave spotted by the police. Something is in there, breathing heavily. The UG enters with the cops who are killed by the sniper. They try to hit the shooter who pulls a predator and turns invisible to get away, but he drops his weapon. The UG bring the sniper rifle back for analysis. Turns out it's a camera. A camera that steals souls. It gives the illusion of death, but the body is just empty while the soul is stored inside the camera. Amagi works to bring the souls out and save Dan. Soga returns to the cave and finds the alien. Alien Wild. Yes, that's his name. Seems he feeds on young lives on his planet. Amagi figures out how the camera works and is called by Soga. He tells them the captain should come to the cave with the film. Kiriyama offers a trade, the film for Soga. But it was all a ruse. He and Futahashi get Soga out of there and Wild breaks out that dragon from before called Nurse. Hello, Nurse! Meanwhile, Amagi figures out how to reverse the camera and works to bring Dan back to life. Ultra Hawk battles Nurse in the air. Wow, talk about pulling the strings. Pull the string! Pull the string! They do manage to shoot the tail off, but Nurse rebuilds itself as a UFO and takes off as Wild boards it. UFO Nurse opens fire on the crew, but Dan gets out and transforms. After he takes care of Nurse, the UG think Dan is still gone, but... I'm on a horse.
now we come to episode 12, From Another Planet with Love, the infamous band episode of Ultra 7. The one you will not find on any releases of the Ultra 7 series anywhere. Why was this episode banned, you ask? The monster of the week, Alien Spell, was designed to look like survivors of nuclear bombs, known as Hibukusha. The atomic bombs America dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there were indeed survivors who had to live with radiation poisoning and certain skin deformities who were, and apparently still are, discriminated against heavily in Japan. So an alien that's mocking bomb survivors is pretty much comparable to doing something like blackface. Needless to say, such a blatant lampooning of these victims was excised by Superaya Productions, and that's why it's never seen the light of day again. However, the episode was dubbed into English and was shown on TNT, as I mentioned last time. The English dubbed episode 12 may be still floating somewhere on the internet, but I wouldn't know where to find such things. So out of respect, I've decided not to go into full detail about this episode, but I wanted to point out why there's no episode 12 of Ultra 7 anymore. There is another episode that's kind of banned in Japan, but we'll get to that later. In episode 13, The Man Who Came From V3, an alien spacecraft is attacking Space Station V3. The UFO is out of fuel and is stuck on Earth. Kiriyama is alerted to the situation, and the UG go to look for Karada. They then spot the UFO, which opens fire on them. Amagi and Furuhashi are hit and go down. Karata's ship is hit, and he objects just in the nick of time. Seems he and Kiriyama are old friends who serve together. Soga asks to look for them, but Karata wants payback for the aliens and what they did to his men. Speaking of which, Amagi and Furuhashi have been kidnapped and are on said UFO. They're then duplicated and programmed to steal fuel from the TDF. When they return, Dan notices something strange about them. They also don't seem to remember Karata. Dan knows something is up. The two fakers go for the fuel, and Dan catches them in the act. They shoot at him, but he returns fire, hitting them both. Kiriyama decides to bait the aliens with fuel, especially after they threaten to attack humans if not given what they want. The captain decides to make the exchange himself in Ultra Hawk 3. Karata goes after his friend to get some payback. I like this guy. Amagi and Furuhashi are still on board, however, and Dan and Soga try to get in to save them. The UFO gets the fuel and Soga is injured, and Dan tells him to wait. He runs off and transforms into Ultra 7. At least you didn't knock him out this time, Dan. Seven saves the others and gets them off the ship just in time. A giant monster appears outside the ship and attacks the crew. Furuhashi and Amagi find Soga and the three open fire on it. Seven grows big and fights this alien Eros. Seven uses Ultra Beam on it, but it doesn't do much damage. It begins to spin, which deflects Seven's Eye Slugger. Seven then breaks out his trump card, the Wide Shot. Very similar to the Spatium Beam used by the original Ultraman, but this one isn't used as often. The two Hawks shoot down the UFO, and the two old friends congratulate each other. Karata heads back to V3 in Hawk 2 as Kiriyama bids him farewell over the comlink. <laughs> Yeah. 
episode 14, Westward Ultra Guard Part 1, here we get the new spinning intro to Ultra 7. This thing looks like it was filmed in a paint mixer. And we come to the first two-parter of this series. In Kobe Port, a Westerner watches a ship explode. Guy looks like George Lazenby. You know, that James Bond who only did it for one movie. It seems that several Caucasian foreigners visiting Japan are being bumped off, as another one is immediately sniped at the airport. Ultra Guard gets the call, but Kiriyama wants to leave this one to the cops. That is, until Manabe tells him that all the people killed were TDF members from other branches outside Japan. He tells them that a recent observation rocket to planet Padan, slash the Dark Planet, revealed that they found something. The life forms were not happy that we were interested in their materials. Alien Padan threatened to attack. So it's pretty obvious who's doing the killing here. Manabe not only puts the Ultra Guard on the job, but they have to play bodyguard as well to a Miss Dorothy Anderson, a scientist from the TDF Washington base. She's obviously the next target, and they have a photo of the supposed assassin. So the crew heads out in the pointer, and she's shot again soon after. They get her to safety at the rendezvous, though. <laughs> アンダーソンさん、安心してください。我々が必ず締め上げてやります。今度の事件はワシントン基地の責任です。何地球は一つですよ。ワシントン基地も極東基地もありませんよ。待て。おい、だ。アンダーソンさん、あなたを撃ち
Episode 15, Westward Altar Guard Part 2, Seven looks down for the count. King Joe, thinking it's one, heads back to the TDF base. Seven gets up and chop blocks him. It then splits apart and retreats. Not sure why he did that when he clearly had Ultra 7 beat, but whatever. I guess if he didn't, we'd have no show. The Ultra Guard learns that the real Dorothy was kidnapped, so that's how Padan knows everything. Dan tells them the Padan assumed that Earth wants to invade their planet. Kiriyama orders the Professor to find a fatal flaw in Padan. He then orders the U.S. agent Melvin Webb to search for Dorothy. Mommy, the UG goes undercover to do some spying of their own. Dan finds another Dorothy clone and tries to convince the aliens that Earth does not want a war with Padan. So, as an act of good faith, the aliens offer to return the real Dorothy if they give up their research on Padan. It seems we've come to terms. But naturally, the aliens were untrustworthy and they send an armada of ships to Earth. Looks like they want Earth for their very own. V3 spots it and Kiriyama alerts the others. And to make things worse, King Joe is back for more destruction. One of the attack buildings has people trapped inside. Ultra Hawk opens fire but can't make a dent in Joe. Dan tries shooting King Joe with no luck and then he reluctantly transforms to fight. Time for round two. Seven and Joe have a water fight this time as Soga saves the trapped people in the building. It's a good thing Joe doesn't rust in the water being, you know, a robot. Maybe alien metal is rust proof. Who knows? Ultra 7 is nearly drowned by King Joe, and Dorothy finally wakes up in time to help. She has a plan to make a bomb that will be strong enough to destroy King Joe. Thankfully, the UG arrives with the bomb just in time. They only have one shot, though, so they can't afford to miss. They try to fire, but 7 is in the way. He trips up Joe and holds him down long enough for them to shoot it. Direct hit. However, a piece tries to float away. 7 uses his wide shot to destroy it, ending the invasion for good. In episode 16, The Eye Shining in Darkness, a space probe called Sakura 9 has disappeared and reappeared and Ultra Hawk heads out to track it. Dan, Ann, and Soga spot it and Dan hears some strange sounds coming from the probe. Suddenly his comrades get sick. Something's wrong. Meanwhile, a boy named Hiroshi gets bullied when he finds a strange rock. The kids try to take it from him, but then it glows and the kids fall over in pain. Except for Hiroshi. He runs away just as Ultra Guard shows up. It seems the rock is what's causing this. No, not that rock. They call Kiriyama and tell him what they found. Hiroshi takes the rock home and cleans it. Suddenly the power goes out and he hears voices coming from somewhere. It says it wants its body back, and of course it's the rock he found that's talking to him. The voice says it will help the boy get revenge on the bullies if he returns the rock to where he found it. That night, the UG wonders what could have hurt these kids. Suddenly, the car stops and Dan shoots at something watching them. They try to question Hiroshi, but he and the rock are missing. Dan chases the boy all the way up to the mountains. The rock is dropped in the mountain where Dan catches up to Hiroshi and a kaiju is awakened by it. The ruckus causes a landslide, knocking Dan and Hiroshi out cold. Ultrahawk shows up and opens fire on this monster. Anon. Wait, Anon? 
Isn't that that hacker group that wears the V for Vendetta masks? The monster blasts them with green laser eyes. Dan wakes up and transforms. Anon tells them it does not trust Earthlings and attacks him. Ultra 7 appears and actually freezes Anon in place with laser rings and makes it move. He says the Earthlings are not lying. It seems Anon simply wanted to protect planet Anon. Seven takes the eye out of the monster's rock body and flies it home. Hiroshi is also returned home safely. Even the kids who bullied him are happy to see him home safe. Guess Saul is forgiven. Well, good. <laughs> Episode 17, Underground Go Go Go, a coal mine experiences a cave-in. And of course, the UG are called into the scene. It seems a flash of light happened before it occurred. This is the third in a string of accidents. They manage to save all but one, a fella named Jiro who's trapped below. Jiro screams for help but no one hears him. He gets a plan to alert that he's alive by banging on a pipe. Dan hears this with his ultra hearing but no one else can. Dan then sees him and then remembers a man who cut his own climbing rope to save a friend. Seven caught him just before he fell to his death. And that's where Ultra Seven got his human disguise from, Jiro. Dan volunteers to go save this man with the token drill vehicle for this show, the Magma Riser. They drill into the ground with Magma Riser to look for Jiro and what's ever causing these cave-ins. Kiriyama tells them that Jiro has 30 minutes of air left, so they must hurry. They try to blast through a granite wall, but it's too strong. A metal door slams down, trapping them underground. Dan takes some explosives out to open the door. They spot some strange glowing device in the hole. Again, it looks like the inside of a TARDIS. Okay, were they watching Doctor Who when they made this show? It would explain a lot. Suddenly a robot appears and opens fire. They shoot it and seemingly neutralize it, but it's got friends. The crew goes inside the ship, and let's not kid ourselves, it's another goddamn UFO, keep up, and do their best stealth campaign, but end up shooting more robots. <laughs> One of these alien bots puts Dan on an operating table. Oh no, they're killing him with a KFC heat lamp! Those monsters! He tries to transform, but his equipment is gone. <laughs> Oh, come on. The... He blasts the robots and flies out the ship or underground base, whatever it is. He smashes through the wall and finds Jiro, unconscious but still alive. He puts him in the magma riser while the others rig the place to explode. They get in the magma riser, escape, and blow it to smithereens.
In episode 18, Escape from Space X, the UG go skydiving. It's not a thrill seeker, it's special training. Given how often their aircraft is shot down, they definitely need parachute training. Everything seems to be going well, except Amagi's a bit of a coward. Soga and Amagi jump last while the others land just fine. The others don't land, though, and Dan wonders what happened. Both Amagi and Soga wake up in a strange forest, their parachutes caught on trees. Some huge bugs fall and attack Soga. He scrapes them off and shoots them. Amagi finds a message on Soga's parachute that warns them that they're not in Kansas anymore, or Japan, or wherever. This is no ordinary forest they landed in. Amagi spots a giant monster and shoots at it. It then somehow makes after images of itself. Or teleports, I'm not quite sure. Furuhashi looks for them in a helicopter but doesn't spot them. Or their parachutes. They almost get caught in a swampy bog but make it out safely. Soga tries to call HQ, luckily both their distress calls were picked up. Soga tells them where they are and how they're not sure where it is. At the same time, an intense buzzing causes Dan pain. Kiriyama orders them to look for the others in Ultra Hawk 3. Amagi and Soga do their best to recuperate after the swamp ordeal. Amagi hears some strange buzzing noise and investigates it. They look up and they can see the Earth. Wait a minute, where have I seen that before? We're gonna need a new plan. They inform Kiriyama that they're not on Earth. It's some kind of alternate dimension or space. Commander Manabe remembers a similar situation with pocket dimensions. An alien bell that manages to disrupt brain waves with sounds of, what else, a bell. It may be impossible to save them as Manabe has tried to do the same before in a similar situation. Suddenly he hears that sound too. <laughs> Meanwhile, Soga and Amagi are attacked by some smoke-spewing creature. Soga goes for his spider gun, not to be confused with the spider shot. Good thing they parachuted in with that thing, right? The UG heads out again to find them by tracking their receiver signal. They spot a strange cloud in the sky that begins pulling them in like a tractor beam. Sure enough, that's where they are, but they suddenly get attacked again by another big bug. Where's the Orkin man when you need him? Dan distracts the bug while the others save Soga and Amagi. Dan hears that intense ringing again and spots the giant monster from before. Alien Bell. He nearly passes out but transforms just in time. Even transformed, he's still susceptible to that sound. Alien Bell tries to take advantage of this and run, but Seven chases him. He throws Bell into the swamp and then just flies off. I guess he won? The dimension begins to disappear for some reason and they all get out before it does. Even Dan. Naturally. In episode 19, Project Blue, the UG have a new feature to test out. Project Blue, a security force field that was built to block out alien invasions. I'm guessing this doesn't work because we have like 20 or 30 more shows after this of alien invasions, so yeah. Spoiler alert, it doesn't pan out. If it did, this would be a very short show. Because if you hadn't noticed, this show sort of relies on alien invasions. Of course, something crashes through the force field and landed in a forest causing a wildfire. This barrier, created by Professor Miyabi, is not done yet, but it is up and running. 
The UG decide to have some downtime while it's active. Dan worries that aliens may not be able to enter, and that they may not be able to explore space anymore once it's fully operational. Kiriyama assures him it will be fine. Why? Because there's secret entrances for them to get through. Okay, then. Meanwhile, the professor sees a hitchhiker and offers a ride, but they disappear. When he gets home, he presents his hot blonde wife with a gift. Ladies love them professors, don't they? Forget bodybuilders and jocks, they go for the brains. Every time. Suddenly, the house shakes. Furuhashi then gets a message from Amagi on the lunar base. He says an alien is targeting the professor, but they were too late to stop it from going to Earth. Dan is ordered to go on patrol in Ultra Hawk 3. The professor's wife is worried, but he reassures her it'll be alright. They then go upstairs to have some sweet, sweet... Oh, they sleep in separate beds. Never mind. The prof thinks somebody is watching him. His wife says it was just a bad dream. In the morning, his wife is gone and left him a message. He goes downstairs for breakfast and finds a secret passage. Gee, I usually don't see that until after I've had breakfast. He goes in and it shuts behind him. Idiot. He's then attacked by killer duct tape. Turns out he fell right into a trap by Alien Bado, the so-called Emperor of the Universe. <laughs> Courtesy laugh. He claims his alien race has been around for years, even before Earth was a true planet. He says they turned Pluto into a barren wasteland, and now it's Earth's turn. Joke's on you, pal. Pluto's not even a planet anymore. Bato wants the secrets of Project Blue, but the professor isn't talking. His wife comes home and... Wait, did they even give her a name? She can't find her husband, and Bato threatens to kill her unless he talks. Oh, that's her name. Well, the UG can't contact him, but Kiriyama orders Dan to go make sure he's okay. And goes with him because, well, duh. Of course she does. The alien Bado attacks Grace. And from this angle, he looks like Quark from Star Trek. Dan tries to get in, but the door is locked, so they shoot it open. Bado tries to attack, but Dan shoots it, burning it up. Hmm, self-cleaning new tent. Leaves only the fresh scent of pine. <sighs> Dan takes Grace to safety and tells Anne to watch her. Another Bato appears, and Dan shoots it. He transforms and goes through a portal in the mirror. Bato tries to escape with the Professor in the ship. But Seven goes giant size and just brings the ship down. A big Bato appears, and we get a slugfest. Ah! Oh, he's busted open! Ouch! Seven takes the ship back into space, and then the professor reveals he wrote the plans on Grace's new dress. Clever. Talk about dressing smart. In episode 20, Defeat Seismic Source X, Dan and Soga get yelled at by a crotchety old professor. His new assistant, Sakaki, introduces himself to them. Seems he's an expert on the Earth's core. Oh great, time to babysit another professor. At the same time, the UG is investigating a series of abnormal earthquakes. Meanwhile, these two girls are out for a morning drive when they get their car stuck in a mountain road. Well, it didn't help that you had 13 on your car, ladies. Bad luck. They spot some strange pink rock on the ground. What is it with rocks in this show? Jeez. The girls run as another earthquake happens. Dan and Anne go to see the professor, but find Sakaki instead. Seems his predecessors all departed. So he's in charge now. 
Meanwhile, the others go out and Ultra Hawk to see where the earthquake happened. They find the girl's car, abandoned, and then they find the girls. They said they hid after a loud roar was heard. Whatever could that be, I wonder. They go to a strange house in the middle of nowhere, and wouldn't you know it, the stubborn old professor is there. He reluctantly lets them in, and Sakaki is there too. The old man sees the rock the girls found, and he and Sakaki know what it is. Ultonium. Not to be confused with Professor Utonium. A mineral that is found deep underground, but something or someone drudged it up. That means the Earth's core is in danger of falling apart. This calls for Magma Riser to be used. The old man wants to go with them, but Sakaki says it's too dangerous. So they dig while the two professors and Anne go back to the house. While underground, Furuhashi can't reach Kiriyama. Something's blocking the signal. An alarm goes off, meaning the temperature is rising fast. Sakaki thinks that they may have hit magma and melted. Wow, that's just grim. He says there's something wrong with the old man, pointing to his shadow, saying it resembles a monster. So he and Anne sneak out. He drops something on the way, and the girls pick it up. Oh yeah, those girls, they're still here too. Not sure why they didn't hitchhike home, or the UG didn't drop them off, but whatever. The old man looks at it and wonders why Sakaki would have this. He runs after them, but Sakaki tries to convince Anne he's causing all this. He denies that that device is his, and he confronts him while the old man goes to throw it off the cliff. Sakaki takes it back and reveals he was an alien all along. Alien Chaple. Not to be confused with Sharpay. He, of course, was behind all these earthquakes. He shows Anne how he did the shadow trick with hypnosis. Anne shoots him, but not before he calls his monster to rise up. Gigadorus. Meanwhile, the others in Magma Riser have indeed hit a cavity, and it's filling up with liquid hot magma. They're all done for if they don't find a way out. They all soon succumb to the rising heat inside, and Dan struggles to transform, dropping his Ultra Eye. Thankfully, he does eventually transform and gets the vehicle out of the ground. Now to deal with Gigadorus. Find time for a dust storm and a thunderstorm to happen at the same time. Seven decides to keep this fight short and just lops its head off with Eye Slugger. Damn! It bleeds buckets of... rocks? Seven flies off and Dan comes back to wake up everyone who's passed out in the magma riser. Of course. All is well. Well, that's it for now. Check back next time and we'll see one bitchin' battleship, a dinosaur tank, and Ultra 7 will have to face one of his greatest weaknesses ever. Bring a jacket. And I'll see you in the land of light. What a man! ボクのうちの地下に地球を破滅させてしまう爆弾がある。それを早く。あ、あなた。ウルトラセブン弾がいないのよ。<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>